All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for, for coming out and uh, I hope you're fired up from Curtis. That was a real pleasure and an honor to get to see someone who's led such an important battle and someone who inspired me and I think others at Garfield High School too uh, to what resistance can look like. So um, I'm glad you're here today. We got some, some strategizing to do because we had an important victory against the map test at Garfield High School, but really it's just, uh, I think, the very beginning of transforming public education and fighting uh, for quality assessments instead of just testing and punishing. So uh, we have assembled here um, panelists from Garfield High School. Um, my esteemed colleagues here, Rachel Eels, Mallory Clark, and a student of mine, uh, at Garfield Falmata are going to present the story of the map test boycott, how and why we organized it, what we won from it, <clears throat> what we're still fighting for, uh, and then hopefully we can brainstorm uh, work in small groups when we're done with our presentation to, to think through what resistance to standardized testing can look like in your building, in your community and what alternatives to those tests uh, that you think would be relevant and honor the learning that goes on in, in your building. So um, with that, we're going to start with Mallory, uh, Rachel, myself, and Falmata uh, has special presentation for you guys. Uh, I'm really excited to do this. Um, but I, I want you to know that the truth is that the very first year that the map test came out, I took my students to do the map test, and it was a disaster for me. Um, I teach a remedial reading class. Most of my students read at the fourth grade level and below. And uh, with nine hours of instruction, which is about how much time a, a student took back then to take the map test in a year, I could get significant reading level gains with my students. So to have them removed from the classroom and go somewhere where they're basically playing with a keyboard and uh, um, not producing any learning and not producing anything of worth for teachers as well. Um, uh, the second year, I decided I would not take my students down. So I haven't brought my students to the testing lab to take the MAP test um, since that first year is over. Awesome. And the <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, She's been boycotting uh, for years. <laughs> <laughs> and the, te the testing coordinator this year came and said, uh, you can't do that underground anymore. Uh, the, test, the reporting procedures are now such that you won't be able to get away with that uh, uh, if you want to do it subterranean. And so really, the, it's a moral issue. Uh, and it, it, so there really isn't another choice. Pretty much it has to be, I have to do it in public. Um, but I didn't want to do it alone. And uh, the testing coordinator knew, coordinator knew of one other teacher who was probably willing to do it with me, but uh, we wanted at least one more person. We thought one more person, three of us, we can do this. And we split the names of the teachers and the tested subjects and she went off to talk to math and in language uh, learning and I went to talk to special ed and to the, my department, the language arts department. And every single person we spoke with said, I'm in. And with, so within a couple of days, we had 24 people who were in. And the following Wednesday was our faculty meeting, the staff meeting, and Jesse told everybody what we were doing. And we voted whether or not we would support that effort. And almost 100% uh, of the faculty supported it, just a few people uh, needed to abstain, they needed more information, nobody voted against it. Uh, very exciting. Shortly after that, the PTSA board voted 100% unanimously right. to, to uh, back us. And then not too long after that, the associated student body did exactly the same thing. So I have never, I've been in other fights before, but I had never been in a fight where the entire community involved right. was in for something scary that was uh, we really could lose over it. Um, it, was, it was a remarkable experience. And the, 
those are the 24 of us who stood to possibly be disciplined uh, by the district for our action. Uh, we got together and, and created a support group for each other. We called ourselves the necks because we were the ones sticking our necks out. And the very next meeting of the entire faculty when that group's existence was announced, uh, the rest of the faculty said, well then we're gonna be the backs because we have your back. And it was an exciting um, sort of show of support for us. Um, so you know that possibly that the district threatened a 10-day uh, no-pay suspension for us. And it was, a, it was a turning point. It could have been a turning point for us because our reasoning for not doing the MAP test was because we didn't want to disrupt education. And for have all of us, 24 of us, gone for two weeks out of our classroom, that's more disruptive than even the MAP test. So we couldn't morally feel comfortable about going through with it when that was going to be the impact on our students. But Rachel and I actually, both of us had the simultaneous uh, brainstorm that we'll just volunteer in our classrooms <laughs> and there's nothing they can do about that. And then someone said, well, not the district, but someone who cared about us said, they can arrest you for trespassing if they put you on suspension and you come in. And we went, oh, that's, that makes it a little scarier. And then we thought, that's a great photo op, <laughs> right? Arrest me, trying to teach in my own classroom. I like this. And we, talked, we all talked about it, that Rachel and I both had this, that idea. And uh, we, we talked about it in front of a lot of people, and we have no idea whether that rumor reached the district or not, but they did take that threat off the table. Um, so th there are lots of things I could tell you about highlights of, of the, that whole, month, what was it, like five months or something mm -hmm. like that. The one thing I do, a couple things I do need to tell you about, and that's as soon as this whole decision went public, um, it, it, we didn't think it was going to be a big deal. We thought, well, a dialogue between us and our administration, who else cares about this kind of thing, right? But the instant it hit the press, thousands of letters started pouring in, emails started pouring in. We, I would get emails, everyone would get yeah. emails, I just picked your name randomly off your website. We're so excited you're doing this, thank yeah. you. Uh, we got drawings from children, we got boxes of chocolate, we got yeah. gift bags, we got um, yeah. roses. Two different times we got mm -hmm. a dozen roses sent to us. And the teachers in Florida sent us pizza for the yeah. entire <laughs> faculty. Um, and there were times when it was scary and we weren't sure we really wanted to continue but because of all that support that's right we couldn't stop you know i kept thinking we can't give the pizza back you know we have to keep doing this <laughs> that's right um and it actually has changed how i relate to other people's struggles around the country i now send cards and letters and emails mm. every chance i get when mm -hmm. somebody's doing something scary um because it meant so much nice. to us um and I know that it was helpful for other That's people. Right. So it came to a point towards the end where the district told our administrators, you see that that test happens tomorrow or you will lose your jobs. And we discussed a lot of ways of handling that situation, including being really angry at our administrators for caving, right? We were talking about, oh, we should be angry at them. But um, Jesse uh, uh, said to us from the very beginning that there, one of the things that was going to make us strong was to keep a wedge from being driven in that community unity that we had. And he spoke up against us doing that, and we said, right, right, we love these people. We love our administrators most of the time. <laughs> um, and th th you know, we, they're in a really tight place. And they proposed to give, us, give the map to our students in a way that would keep us from being disciplined. Um, they, so they were, they were trying to be as smart about it as they possibly could. Uh, so we strategized, okay, can we chain ourselves to the <laughs> testing lab door? No, that's disrupting education. Let's see, can we, because we'd have to be out of our classrooms to do that. Um, can we have a walkout? No, that's disruptive. So we just went home defeated. We felt sad. 
Um, we didn't know what to do. And we came to school the next morning, and there were parents out front with leaflets. And in front of every single tested subject classroom, there were at least two students with an armload of leaflets that said, you, student, do not have to take this test. You can sit quietly and respectfully and not get up and not go down to the testing lab. And very few tests were given That's that right. day. That's right. And it, it made us feel, we always had felt supported by our community, but that decision on the part of the parents and the students uh, was material support. We are not in this alone. It's not just teachers that hate this testing regime and understand the politics behind it and want to fight it. It's also students, it's also parents and communities. So we, it was an amazing experience for us. We are different people now. Um, we, we don't, I, maybe even Rachel's going to talk more about that, but we don't take guff the way we used to. <laughs> and um, we're really excited about the possibilities for the future. We know that Smarter Balance is coming to our district this coming year, mm. not, not this year, but the following year. Right. And it's, we need to start thinking about That's that. Right. Yeah. yeah, all right. So I'm going to come at things a little different, from a little bit different angle, because I actually started using the MAP test long before Seattle School District teachers were using it. And in my second year of teaching in 2003, 2004, I was a big proponent of the MAP. And I uh, was in a district that was really trying to use the data. And I thought it was a wonderful alternative to a benchmark assessment because I had that year, I remember specifically one of my classes from middle schoolers, mostly reading at second and third grade reading levels, about a third of them with IEPs, about a third some overlapping um, in ELL. And I knew they weren't, as much as they could grow, they weren't going to pass the benchmark assessment. And I thought this is a way that we can still demonstrate that meaningful learning is happening in the class. And I worked really hard with colleagues to try to understand what we could pull from the data. And as a school, we had, over time, tried to instill in students that the assessment was meaningful. And it, and it was for them because our school used that to direct their classes and many other things. And as teachers, we really tried to use that. because I understood at some point one element of the standards movement coming from a social justice orientation to say we have horrible inequity in our mm -hmm. country. That's right. Students are not receiving an equal education. And in some ways, testing highlights that and says we have to pay attention. We cannot continue with this injustice. And so I believed in it for a while. However, I found over time that as there were layers of problems that kept unfolding. One was that as I tried to use the information, and in our district we got strand data, so I got all kinds of details from the students, and I would analyze that, and I would make subgroups of, you know, small groups, okay, I'm gonna pull this group aside for these, this reading strategy work, and then I'd get them all together and start to try and do something and say, you're all at different places. Mm. The math data I got, mm. that didn't help me group you properly. Mm. And increasingly, I felt like I was wasting hours and hours of an wow. analysis. And with my intelligent colleagues, one who's in the room now, and <laughs> think, I remember these times of trying to figure out how to make it meaningful. Mm. And I began to have a sorrow grow in me that I, I have been providing a new injustice for my students by using the time my colleagues and I have to collaborate to do something that's not ending up benefiting students. And we could be using that time so much more meaningfully. I also saw that when I started teaching at that school, I was really energized by the group of teachers I was with who were very social justice oriented. We were doing some exciting things of trying to reinvent and rethink what our school was like. Over time, we became a skills school. And there are some good things that happened there. There are also things where I felt some of the heart and soul was lost, and that assessments do drive much of what happens, and that when you suddenly have these hundreds of different discrete skills you're trying to make sure you have a spot for, 
that, and that's the data you have, that started to guide everything. And I felt like the other more meaningful work, the mm. context in which reading matters was mm. forgotten. Thank you. And I ended up leaving that school for a variety of reasons. Um, wow. But I, I was still processing much of what I thought about math. And then when I came to Garfield, it's interesting how when you get space from somewhere, you start to see things differently. And I could see some of what I've just named to you with more clarity, where in the midst of it, I just was feeling an internal tension. Like somehow I am not the teacher I want to be, but I'm trying so desperately. Mm. Uh, and with some space, I realized how MAP actually was one of the components that had created this context at my school mm. that made it a place where I couldn't be the teacher I wanted to really help my students develop a sense of who they were as whole human beings. And I look back at some conversations I had with parents or students with shame because of our analysis of those numbers and what they meant for the students. And um, there were some good things that happened there too. But there was a lot that I think became really tragic and was lost. So then I came to Garfield and I learned that students took the test as a joke and teachers didn't know even how to begin using any information from it. So anything that even could matter from it <laughs> was not there. And there is this, you know, part of me that says, well, we could address those things, but would that become a school I'd want to be in? And would that be serving our students with the kind of education they need? No. Um, so when I was uh, approached by Mallory to say, how do you feel about the map? I kind of came in with that complexity of energy, but to say, yeah, I would gladly stand with my colleagues and say no to this assessment because it has been a contributing factor to some real negative impacts I've seen on education. And it's interesting because I wouldn't have a couple of years before picked that MAP would have been my issue and when I ended up being interviewed and different things, <laughs> I, so bizarre, I wouldn't have anticipated this. And yet I think like Mallory said that pouring in of support also helped me reframe things and recognize again the, all the many problems with our standardized testing. And again, what I said of how assessment guides what we're doing. And we need to seek out the kinds of data that will help us if we're going to use that and the kinds of assessments that tell us what we really care about and what we determine that our students really need with our students and what they feel like they need. And yes, being a capable reader is an important element of being an active citizen in a democracy. I don't think that the MAP test is going to, assessment is going to help us to get there. Mm. Um, and increasingly, there are, there are countless other problems we could dig into with it as an assessment as well and why it's not even really aligned at this point to anything That's right. that anyone's going to say we should be teaching. That's right. And um, you know, whether you're a standards person or not, the map doesn't fit with that. Mm -hmm. um, so in standing together, I think we really gained a courage too and a new sense in ourselves as, a uh, new sense of confidence in ourselves as educators to say we, we are professionals and we are highly trained in what we're doing and we have years of experience of working with wonderful students and what they bring to the table and we need to have confidence in standing up for what we know is right and as Mallory said we need to work together and as you know in Jesse's roots of let's not be divided we are not effective when we within ourselves amongst ourselves get into infighting about different education approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have meaningful discussions and analysis, and, um, but we need to work together as a group of educators to say what do our students need and how do we stand up for that. And I think that the success gave us a new confidence. I'd say the tone of our department meetings mm -hmm. in language arts has shifted nice. since the MAP assessment That's to great. take much more critically mm -hmm. and carefully when we get a directive from the district to say, okay, so are there parts of this that really will matter for our students? Let's do them. If not, let's not spend our energy checking boxes and playing games. Let's go ahead and stand up and come together and say, these things are good, we'll do them. These aren't, let's not. And I think that that can have a really powerful impact on, for our students. I think it's empowered us as teachers and I would love to see and hope, as Mallory had referenced to, that that energy will build um, really across the country of can reclaiming our education 
and not letting people from outside of the world of education dictate what we're doing in our classrooms and what our students are receiving. Um, so I think with that, I'm yes. going to turn it to Jesse. <clears throat> I'm Jesse Hagopi and I teach history at Garfield High School and I'm with my heroes here. Um, thank you. I learned a lot at, from, from hearing both of you tell the story. And I got to say that probably the greatest moment of my life, maybe besides my kids being born, uh, is Mallory Clark calling me up on the phone after school one day and saying, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and. I'm the building rep at Garfield High School, one of the building reps, so I'm used to, I get calls all the time about this contract issue or that, so I assumed it was something else I was going to have to mediate and figure out how to uh, solve this problem in, in the building. And when she like looked out the door, see if anyone was there <laughs> and closed it tight, I knew this was going to be something a little different. Sits me down, is like looking over the dividers. <laughs> And uh, she says, I'm not going to give the map test. And I wanted to get up on the table and just <laughs> scream because, you know, two years before I'd helped pass a resolution in our union saying the map test was an inappropriate tool to, to measure teacher effectiveness. And we, uh, we had a big battle and we got the resolution passed. And I'd written articles about the map test before. Uh, but here she was saying she wasn't going to give it. And I immediately thought of Carl Chu, who refused to give the wassail and was suspended and later pushed out of the district. So I said, well, if this is going to be effective, we're going to have, you know, I don't want you to lose your job. It's got to be just more than you. And Mallory said, yeah, I thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, you know, she had talked to a lot of teachers and we began holding uh, sessions to find what do you guys think of this test? And you know, it's not aligned to our curriculum. Um, you know, the, one of the math teachers uh, said he's, he teaches ninth grade algebra and he's seeing geometry questions on the test. So that would be like if you're a Spanish teacher and you see French questions. Okay, it's foreign language, but it's not the same subject. And if it's not aligned to our curriculum, how can you judge me as an educator? You know, I'm a, I'm a history teacher, one of the backs, um, and I had a problem with this test. Uh, I wasn't being directly evaluated by it, but when I try to send my kids to the library to go do some research for a project I've assigned, they'll guess what? The library three times a year is shut down for weeks at a time. You can't go and do research, check out books, use the computer, because we're endlessly assessing, ranking, and sorting our kids. So all this came out, and we held that all staff meeting that Mallory said. And to me, uh, the, the, well, the first thing everyone said was, yeah, we hate this test, but you're the building rep. What's going to happen to us if we refuse to give it? And I, I couldn't sugarcoat it. I wanted, there was part of me that, don't worry about it. Let's just do this, right? But I couldn't say that, uh, you know? Those of you, especially in the tested subjects, if you refuse to give this, you can be labeled insubordinate. And we have a progressive discipline policy, but in the end, uh, you could lose your livelihood. And just, I don't want to shock anybody, but those weren't the words that inspired the staff to <laughs> refuse to give the test. <laughs> uh, you remember Ms. Gunn, I think it was, who stood up and said, I am tired of uh, having this test label my kids and me a failure for a test that's not aligned to our curriculum. And I'd rather be reprimanded for standing up for what I believe in than just sitting back and letting this test run over us. And right there I said, it's time to vote. <laughs> and uh, that's, we got the unanimous vote, the press conference, you know, and it was just chaos. <laughs> the rest of our, our lives thrown into chaos with the thousands of of letters of support coming in and the, the threats from the district. Um, but one of the things I want to highlight is just how absolutely insane this drove the corporate education reformers. I mean, they lost <laughs> their stuff. Uh, 
Do people remember reading Michelle Rees' op-ed in the Seattle Times? She took it upon herself to intervene in our struggle here in Seattle. Uh, and what was great to me was reading her op-ed, just the factual mistakes, because she had no idea how the MAP test was being used in Seattle, uh, saying that it was mandated in our contract when actually that, was, that test isn't named anywhere in our contract. You know, didn't take the time to do basic research, but she starts her column off by saying, uh, students sit up straight. You're getting a front row, real world view of what happens when, uh, when adults uh, uh, squabble and ruin your education. Uh, and the reason why she was just frothing at the mouth and so upset was because we were denying her the lifeblood of the corporate education reform movement, which is that number, that score, right? Their whole project of privatizing education with charter schools, of uh, shutting down schools like you see in Chicago with 50 schools being closed and scores in Philadelphia and around the country. Their, their project of denying kids graduation uh, with these high stakes tests and then pushing them into prison uh, or uh, firing teachers. Uh, all of these things that make up the corporate education reform movement are predicated upon the, their ability to reduce the intellectual process of teaching and learning to a single number and label students and, and teachers a score. And we were denying them that number and they couldn't handle it. <laughs> it was uh, something that, that drove them crazy and uh, you know you saw their, their backlash on, on, on CNN and uh, there was other um, trying to refute us. But the problem that they had is, what do you do if you're Michelle Rhee and you're the head of an organization called Students First, but the students have voted unanimously to support the boycott, right? Can you put their, their needs first then when they vote unanimously, when they do research and create flyers and are engaged in activism? I actually think the students learned more uh, last year than they probably ever did in any school year about how a school system runs, about what it takes to make changes in your society, about what solidarity can look like and what the power is. I mean, the lessons that they learn there, I could not teach in my American government class in the four walls, right? Um, and so that's, uh, I think, the education that we were providing that year. And to me, the beautiful part was that it, didn't, it wasn't just solidarity coming in to support us at Garfield. It was that this thing spread around the nation of people standing up for themselves. So in Portland, we saw a walkout uh, of, of students in, in the Portland uh, public schools. It's the same in Chicago. Uh, in Long Island, 8,000 parents uh, signed up on the opt-out Facebook page and started an opt-out revolution in the state. In Texas, where the Texas miracle, the, the, uh, the, the myth that built No Child Left Behind, um, 13,000 students, parents, and teachers marched on the Capitol demanding an end to the high stakes testing. They had 15 graduation required tests in Texas. And they defeated 10 of them last spring, uh, bringing it down to still too many five. But, uh, you know, in state after state and city after city, we saw what came to be known as the education spring, uh, as this revolt of parents, students, and teachers just, just took off. Um, and I think this, this really happened because we're, we're at a critical moment, I think, in American history. I think we face incredible challenges like we've never seen before. We have mass incarceration in this country, right? In the land of the free, one out of 31 uh, people in this nation is either behind bars, on probation, or, or on parole. So I can look in my class, one out of 31, and know, you know, one of those students is going to be that statistic. And it's not random which one, because we know that there are more black people behind bars today than were slaves on plantations in 1850, right? 
We have social crises in this, in this country. Violence against women uh, and sexual violence against women is insane epidemic in our society and goes unchecked and just perpetuated in the media. We have, we have economic collapse so that one out of every four children is living in poverty in the world's richest country, right? We, we have climate change is threatening the future of humanity in the medium term here, right? We're, we're talking about whether we're gonna survive as a species or not. And I would submit to you all today that none of those problems can be solved by bubbling in A, B, C, or D. That we need a whole different paradigm of assessment that fosters the types of skills that we need to meet those challenges, right? So we need assessments that can look at fostering creativity and collaboration and civic courage uh, and imagination and all types of skills that it's gonna to take to tackle those, those problems. And that's why uh, we, a lot of us at Garfield have been proponents of performance-based assessments that get out a whole range of skills that you can't measure from a standardized test. Standardized tests, I think, measure two things really well. Number one, your ability to eliminate wrong answer choices, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you know the answer to the question or you, <laughs> you're a great reader or, or anything. It's can you eliminate the wrong answer choices and take your best guess at the right one? Oh, if that's the skill that we think is most important in our society today, then we should be investing the billions of dollars that we are in, in the standardized testing industry. <laughs> but if we think that uh, we face real problems, we need to move away from that. The other thing I think that standardized tests measure so well, probably better than anything else, is your zip code right? Uh, not your intellect, not your intelligence, but your access to resources, right? Your, your access to being able to get that tutor that can help you figure out how to eliminate the wrong answer choices, right? The number of books in your home uh, and, and all, of, all of those things we know. And so I'll just end by saying that Arne Duncan is called education, the civil rights movement of our time, our secretary of education. And that would be nice to hear from the highest education official in our land if he also wasn't the very same person who said that Hurricane Katrina was the best thing that ever happened to the New Orleans public school system, right? Because then you wiped out all the schools and you could put in charters. But I do think he's right, though. I think it is a civil rights movement uh, of our time. It's just that as a history teacher, um, and I hope I haven't been teaching Fomata and the other students wrong about this, so you guys check me if I got this, this wrong, but I thought that the civil rights movement, uh, I, well, I don't think it was started by billionaires. <laughs> and I was pretty sure that uh, a certain boycott launched the civil rights movement uh, and showed people the power of solidarity, of standing strong together, uh, and that that example spread throughout the country and helped to create a whole new uh, uh, nation. And I hope that we're at a moment like that. I think that we're, we defeated one test, but we know that Pearson is a multi-billion dollar corporation and they're coming at us with all these other tests uh, and it's gonna, it's gonna take an uprising in this country to reclaim our education. Thank you. Good morning, you guys. My name is Fulmata Said. I am a BSU senator at Garfield High School and 2013 while we were protesting, um, boycotting the MAP test, a lot of what you guys, the success behind the boycott was not necessarily all teachers, which I feel like a lot of people don't see is, it was students and parents. See, this, co yeah. this, this collective like joint solidarity of the students and teachers, you see that when the teachers went under fire, who picked it up? The parents, the students, they were handing out flyers and everything. And really, testing for us, 
as students, we are bombarded with all these tests. For me, I'm a senior, and I have to take SAT, my ACT, worry about my final, and a bunch of more tests. And a lot of times for me, when I was uh, throughout high school, I was like, wow, there's all these tests. I'm always uh, learning a lot of these different things, but what are, where are my interests in all this? Like, where are they accounted for my interests? And a lot of people don't know that I'm also involved in like a bunch of um, community service projects and uh, so, uh, ser social justice projects. For example, um, TSB, the service board, if any of you guys know about that, it's only a couple blocks away. It's on Del Ridge or something like that, I don't remember. Youngstown, is, that's where it's at. And it teaches a lot of youth, there's like a cohort of youth of around 60 people and it teaches them all about these immigrant rights issues, social, uh, I mean, workers' rights issues, LGBTQ issues, and for students to be learning that, like for me, that, that it became my passion. Like, I'm learning all this, but when I come to school, none of that is there. So I'm not learning any of the things that I want to learn. I'm, I don't see the student, like I would learn about something. I'm like, hey, did you know about Yes Sir Terrace, how they're pushing everybody back to the South? And they're like, what are you talking about? They're not doing that. I'm like, what? You know, like there's just the ignorance of what's going on because like programs like this are not at schools. And that was just one of my frustration, frustrations. And during the boycott, I, I, I saw it as like an opportunity for me to like show what I know, show my passion. And so like the boycott, uh, the, the map test was just a spark for me. So, and um, the, I wrote a poem like about my frustrations, like encompassed all, all around my frustrations and all the things that I was seeing that was going around me and everything. And a lot of students also were, when they were participating, they were finding different ways to get involved. And in my way, I got involved by presenting at a press conference they were having about the map test. And I presented this poem and I'm gonna be going into it right now, so. The things that I found and will say sway the opposition in ways that you'll reassess your accusations. We're told the key to success is through education, but what's displayed in their legislations are institutions designed to keep us chained in cages. Pass back the fact that being black means you can't match white wages. Pass back the fact that it's always Goldman Sachs that drains your life savings. Pass back the fact that it's all done in stages. Please open your eyes because this is modern day slavery. I've come to the conclusion that these tests are an illusion, a disguise, a mere mirage for their lives, their crimes under funding education, while at the same time feeding potential Einsteins to the school to prison pipelines. It's the system that I'm trying to undermine. So if you don't mind, please let me state some of my own finds. The U.S. ranks 17th in education amongst the world. But what we're not told is it also ranks number one for the most people incarcerated at 2.3 million, overcrowding jails to the point where there are more inmates than there are beds to sleep in. It costs $63.4 billion a year to continue paying these businesses the profit off the exploitation of people. Why is it that 37% of the black male has not completed high school? Why is it in Seattle there's a plan underway to build a $210 million facility for the incarceration of more youth like me? It doesn't make sense to combat naive crimes that are oftentimes nonviolent with a hostile environment. Instead, we should be helping these youth by creating programs that offer jobs that actually will hire them. Programs that let these youth pursue an education because the public ones don't let them back. And I'm not talking about creating more of these whack and loosely regulated alternative schools where the only thing they do is groom these students to come back to the prison system because that's cruel. Start cutting these $60,000 costs per inmate and increase the state spending from $7,500. You see, 
The Washington state also spends over $100 million on standardized testing. Administer exams like the map this spring, but can't exactly explain what the test brings. It's amazing. These exams are the ones where teachers have no say on how to cater the test to a student's learning. These exams are the ones that measure students to a metric decided by people who have never faced adversity in their life. That's right. These exams are the ones that belittle the hopes and aspirations of kids who were told to dream big. These exams are Malcolm X's teacher that told him he couldn't exceed in his dreams. Malcolm X dropped out of school at the end of eighth grade. He was later known by the name Detroit Red. Now everything Malcolm did was to accumulate the bread because he had held on to what his teacher said. His dreams of becoming a lawyer were no realistic goal for a nigger. In Malcolm's case, he became much bigger than the worth his teacher just slapped on the sticker. But tell me, how much different are these tests? No, really. How are they different? They tell a student that despite his many talents, if he does not shade in the correct box on a test that supposedly defines his intellect, he is doomed to fall. So next fall, he contemplates whether he wants to come back at all. Thank you.